So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. As Professor Trout laid out, uh, this is a panel where we're going to be exploring this question around equitable growth. Uh, I'm joined and honored to be part of such an esteemed uh, panel. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce a speaker. I'm going to let them give their presentation. After we're done with all the presentations, I'm going to ask some more questions. So if you guys have questions, please feel free to jot them down. It's going to be a long discussion, but then we're going to open up to the audience. So we can walk around the microphone for you guys uh, to ask the questions that you have. So we're actually going to start with somebody who's not from Newark. Um, and his best work, he said, actually was uh, about the city of Camden. Um, it was called Camden After the Fall. So Professor Howard Gillette, who's joining us today, is a professor of history emeritus from Rutgers University, Camden. Um, he was the founder and first director of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Center for Humanities. But his recent publication was about the paradox of urban revitalization. It explores urban challenges and transformations in America's post-industrial cities with a focus on Newark from 1967 in the uprising to the present. And he's currently co-editing another book about the greater Philadelphia region. Professor Howard Gillette. Thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking David we're doing what he's doing. I, I can't think of <clears throat> any way I would modify the goals that uh, this group is uh, involved in. The commitment to the city, the commitment to uh, for interdisciplinary research, all the kinds of things that I try to strive for in various uh, venues as uh, an active scholar now retired. So, as I've already been indicated, the chapter in this book that came out two years ago goes back to the beginning of 1967, but really carries uh, more mostly to the present and looking at the phenomenon that David referred to, which is a, a turn in the, in the post-industrial history of our country, where for the first time, starting in the 21st century, we began to see more money flowing into cities, more investment uh, capable budgets beginning to be balanced to the population reversing from decline to increase. And uh, a lot of the effort to attract uh, newcomers to the city with the uh, consequence uh, that there were tensions at the same time as what about the people who were here. Uh, Certainly equity as it became a central concept and uh, a, a call to action, if you will, in the 21st century was, was in place as far back as 1967. We may not have folded that, but the real problem in the period was, of course, that uh, deindustrialization was proceeding at such a pace that no matter how far people strove for the concept of equity, you always had the um, limitations both of the state, which was withdrawing resources, and of the economy, which is a capitalist system still, uh, which is always inevitable. So when we talked about um, growth and development in the period uh, of the late uh, 20th century, most of it was uneven. Um, even the most activist and foresighted Mayors, particularly starting with Gibson and followed by others, um, was uh, running up the hill. And it's not incidental that every black mayor who was uh, challenged was challenged uh, by a newcomer who said that the city wasn't doing enough for the neighborhoods, it was doing too much for the downtown and not enough for the neighborhoods. And that carried right through uh, to the present. Uh, mayor Baraka didn't. Uh, uh, challenge uh, Tory Booker directly, but he was saying much the same thing as he was coming into office. So what what can we uh, expect when um, the economy begins to pick up? Every city in the country it was, uh, was looking for new investment, and the question was, were, were these cities going to be able to break out of the habit that had dominated the period of the late 20th century of favoring uh, subsidies for business to bring them downtown. 
Uh, that was a kind of a public prior, private partnership. You can call it what you want, but it was always going to end up with the inequitable kinds of investments. That there was no uh, reverberation in the neighborhoods and then across the city in ways that uh, were necessary to try to deal with questions of uh, ongoing poverty and inequality. Uh, That was true in, in even uh, most progressive cities. Coleman Young uh, embraced the Renaissance Center in Detroit. Uh, Mary Berry, God bless him, uh, as much as he was a civil rights activist and a man of the people, uh, he was uh, very chummy with the business community and, and uh, managed to uh, help them out in a lot of ways. And the persistent problems in the neighborhoods, the persistent problems of poverty and inequality, Inadequate schooling and help uh, uh, maintain. But then we had uh, an object, and the question became very quickly how do we capture the um, incoming uh, funds that are coming in? We begin to see things like at Los Angeles pioneering something called uh, community benefits agreements. Uh, I haven't heard much about that in, in Newark, uh, but there were, there's certainly the concept behind that was pretty much the same as uh, other events, that uh, other kinds of schools, which is to say when, when money comes in, as it did in Canada, for example, $3 billion of uh, state money to bring new business into Canada, uh, what are the benefits to the community? How can you capture that and, and convey it? Uh, in Canada, uh, the mayor said, I can take care of it. Uh, don't worry about it. And, and as you might imagine, in such a circumstance, the money uh, just uh, trickled down a little bit in terms of employment. You had no equity in terms of that kind of investment. I, I look at my cities in this latest book, The Paradox of Urban Revitalization, and I have to say, I'm going to give it away right away, um, that yours came out as good, if not better, than every other city I looked at. So it looks like everything is still going well, and I credit not just uh, some of the uh, earlier mayors, but particularly uh, Mayor Baraka, for the force of to be able to combine a series of different actions which were aimed at a more just city, the kind of city that David has talked about. Um, we, we see it in, in specific policies and uh, uh, related to housing and the rights of counsel, so that tenants are, are not uh, threatened with eviction, the Pope for closure program, uh, inclusionary housing, probably the most important element of, of this new investment that a new uh, building comes in, make sure that there's a, a low market rate housing available for people who need it. And, uh, and of course, more recently, the land bank that was authorized by the state legislature. What really impressed me about Mayor Baraka is that uh, Sure, people thought he was going to be a radical. He, he certainly was uh, criticizing uh, Senator Booker from, from the left, but he recognized right away and, and that you have to capture this new money. And I think, particularly of the 2019 State of the City address that he made, in which he told his audience, Look, I'm an activist. At the same time, I have to build, and I want you to build with me. And we can tell people. Um, uh, we cannot tell people who are uh, anxious to come live or work downtown uh, not to do so, but what we have to do is capture that. And what again impressed me about him was his idea that he could curate a city, that he could manage to bring together a variety of different programs, as I just begin to list, and actually be able to uh, shape the whole contours of how money comes in and flows out in that business to a single uh, location. That again, I think is a, an ideal uh, uh, element. And the other thing that strikes me particularly at in seeing all these other cities is the collaboration between business, government, and the universities. Uh, the Hire by Live initiative, oh, which was initiated several years ago, uh, strikes me as just the right thing that for all the cities, not just for, for Europe, but certainly a foundation 
uh, particularly in the way um, there are more attention is given to uh, uh, buying local uh, at the universities in particular. Procurement it becomes a very important indicator of where uh, you want to go. Um, I'm going to wrap up by just uh, raising a couple questions uh, about uh, where this goes. Um, we have in Newark terrific elements to build on. How do we evaluate where we are? Uh, I think the new commission is a, certainly a, one of those places to, to go. But there's also a question of how do you how do you measure what is happening? In? And I think there are some precedents for this in other places. In uh, Pittsburgh and also in Oakland, uh, there have been uh, something called equity indicators put in place. Uh, they've been drawn up by the City University of New York's Institute for State and Local Government, and across about 10 or 12 different uh, spheres. Uh, the city evaluates itself at Pittsburgh in particular uh, each year uh, at a certain level. And you find that uh, it's uneven, that uh, Pittsburgh's done very well in, in certain areas like education and quite poorly in other things. So as important as equity has been in a city like Pittsburgh as it is here, we should look for some measurable uh, mode which we can use over time. And I think there's certainly precedent for that. And finally, I, I'm just going to ask a question that hopefully might come up in our discussion. Uh, is what is, the, what is the role of city planning in all this? Um, most city planners for a long period of time were basically underwriting the uh, public-private partnerships I was talking about before. But over time, uh, some of them, and I look at Baltimore in particular, began to use measurements too. How, what's the effect of putting uh, a zone, making a zoning change in a particular part of the city? What's the reverberation of all that? And are we being equitable in our outcomes? So I think there are, uh, we'll come back to this obviously, but I think there are things to build on here. I'm very excited by the fact that uh, Newark set such a good um, standard for everybody else, uh, but I hope it can be extended and deepened over time. Thank you, Professor Gillette. Uh, write down questions. I think that was uh, like quite a rosy picture of Newark. Uh, <laughs> almost as if, you know, Mayor Barack should have been in the audience uh, to sort of hear some of the ways that, you know, Newark has done really well. But the thing I love about this panel is, you know, look, it's great to sing the praises of Newark, but I think it's good to explore it from a lot of different angles. So our next speaker is going to be Dr. Denise Rogers. She's the Vice Chancellor for Interprofessional Programs at Rutgers Health. Um, she manages educational activities involving multiple schools within RBHS, including the School of Social Work and the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology. More, more uh, interestingly for Newark, she has dedicated her career to studying un serving underserved populations and currently chairs the Greater Newark Healthcare Coalition and the Believe in a Healthy Newark Initiative and has recently com completed her role as a chair of the Newark Homelessness Commission while also leading the Rutgers Equity in Action for Community Health Project by Robert, by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start actually by uh, thanking David Trout for just the incredible work that he leads in Newark. And also thanking David, um, although this is somewhat reluctantly, for always pushing me to have to think outside the box. So I decide that I understand something in a certain way, and then David comes along and says, yeah, not so much. <laughs> and I have grown significantly from that, and I think we have all benefited from his willingness to think outside the box. So much gratitude to you, David, for inviting me to be a part of this. I also want to um, thank Nancy Candy for being such an incredible role model and moral compass for those of us at Rutgers during her tenure with us. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to know Nancy, although I am not part of her chancellor-led unit. Uh, I feel very akin to her leadership 
and her voice, um, and uh, we'll, we'll miss her, her deeply, but we really want to acknowledge and thank you, Nancy, for all that you've done for so many of us. And third, um, I uh, chaired the Homelessness Commission starting in January uh, 2019 um, and going through uh, until June 2022. Uh, so what that means is I chaired the Homelessness Commission through much of the COVID pandemic. And it really um, gave me actually a, a, a great deal of uh, professional satisfaction and pride to work with innumerable people um, who uh, all we all came together right after the pandemic began to have 8 a.m. Friday morning meetings to talk about how we can prevent a major outbreak of COVID in the shelters in the city. And we did it. We did not have a major outbreak of COVID in the shelters. <laughs> I don't say I, I, I am so pleased to have been part of the group that uh, accomplished that. When I think about the uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, I go back to a man that I went to college with. And um, it was a long time ago, as you can imagine from all my gray hair. <laughs> but um, this man, whose name was John, um, had a psychotic break during our sophomore year in college. And I was with him through part of that psychotic break. And of course he had to withdraw from school. And I lost track of him for many, many years and then went to an event where his sister was. And I asked his sister how he was doing. And she relayed to me that he was experiencing homelessness on the streets of Washington and had been doing so for decades. And I am reminded when I walk past many of the people experiencing homelessness in Newark that we don't know what their backstories are. We don't understand how people got there. And because we don't want to think too much about how people got there, we sometimes turn off our compassion and turn on our annoyance. Yes. And I'm here to encourage us to actively work to stop doing that mm -hmm. because we can do better. Mm -hmm. So part of what I have in my remarks is that, you know, in late November of 2023, Mayor Baraka announced the 57.6% reduction in the number of unsheltered people experiencing homelessness in the city. And so we went in, in from uh, 3,841 unsheltered people down to 1,627 unsheltered people. Um, and that's good because, as you can imagine, living on the street is really bad for your health, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're exposed to the elements. You're more likely to have substance use, mental illness mm -hmm. without connection to uh, services. You're more likely to be a victim of violence, that sort of thing, right? So that's a good thing. But if you have been reading the papers lately, and of course, in preparation for this, I was reading the papers, and of course, four days ago, there's a story about the horrible conditions yes. in one of the shelters here in Yes. And so on the one hand, we say to people, you gotta get off the street. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we say, well, but you have to go to this place that by all accounts in the paper, and I will confess very clearly, I have not been there. So I cannot attest to the factual basis of what was in the paper, but the paper paints a really ugly picture of lots of rodents and insects and poor conditions and that sort of thing. So we say, leave the street and come to this place that is completely inadequately prepared to care for you. And so we must and should do better. <clears throat> I want to pause here for a moment to provide you with a federal definition of homelessness so we're all on the same page. So people are homeless if they lack a fixed, adequate nighttime residence, will imminently lose their residence without another place to go, or are fleeing interpersonal violence. And that's the other aspect of homelessness 
that we don't quite talk enough about is the number of people who must leave their homes for fear for their lives. Mm -hmm. So another blessing for me is that in February 2024, this year, a couple months ago, the Journal of Health Affairs devoted an entire issue to the issue of housing and health. That's a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about. I got from that journal. And if you want to go online, healthaffairs.org, you too can read this journal. Um, and uh, I think it's very, very uh, significant um, that they focused on this. And, and obviously, much of that focus was also on um, issues related to people experiencing homelessness, because obviously, uh, being homeless is, is bad. For um, and I hope no one has any question about that. Um, researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, interviewed about 3,200 people in California. California is in the state with 30% of the country's uh, homeless population. Mm -hmm. They found that 60% of the population had a chronic disease, 66 had symptoms of mental illness, and substance use, of course, was, was very common. Mm -hmm. According to the 2023 New Jersey point in time count, there were 10,267 people experiencing homelessness in the state in January 2023. Essex County had the highest percentage of homeless people at 17%. And of course, the majority of those who are homeless in Essex County are in New York. Mm -hmm. So according to the point in time count, one in three homeless people in New Jersey have mental illness, one in five suffers from substance use disorder, 15% have a physical disability, and 16% reported having chronic health conditions. These numbers are far less than what they found in California. And you know what I'm going to tell you? Our numbers are wrong. There's no way we're not seeing the same levels of chronic illness. Right? So, so we just we don't have the capacity to capture the data as well as they do in, in California, right? But we know a substantial part of the people living either in shelters or on the streets have things like hypertension and diabetes and heart disease that are poor people. We know that. We know that significantly more people have severe persistent mental illness and also untreated substance use disorder. And that's on us. But what I want to stop for a moment to have all of you think about is that in January of 2023, in New Jersey, there were 10,267 people experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. There are 8 million people in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. New Jersey is the first or second or third, whoever's doing the county, richest state in the country, and we can't figure out how to house 10,000 people? Why do we tolerate that? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. So, if we are going to have a truly equitable growth in Newark, it's imperative that all residents of the city have access to high quality housing, affordable housing, right? safe housing. People also have to have access to high quality physical, mental, and oral health care. And everyone should be able to get drug treatment on demand. Everybody. Another important article from Health Affairs that I want to discuss very briefly is entitled Gentrification Yields Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Exposure to Contextual Determinants of Health. That's the whole title. That's the whole title. I'm sorry, I know, right? But I got, I got to give credit because, you know, people get in trouble because I get the credit these days. So I got to give credit. It's written by Arthur Eckerman, lead author from the University of Washington, along with co authors from UW and Cornell. This study looked at changes in certain contextual determinants of health. So the de contextual determinants of health they looked at were healthcare access, social deprivation, air pollution, and walkability. They looked at this in six cities, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, and San Francisco. Now, when you hear me read what I'm going to read, let's not believe that Newark is all that different and what they found in these six cities isn't going to be relevant in Newark as well. Just saying. So, quoting from the abstract, 
we found that gentrification was associated with overall improvements in the likelihood of living in medically underserved areas across racial and ethnic groups. So when gentrification, when people with more money come in, healthcare comes in too. Key, what is price? Yes, sir. Um, but, but it was also associated with increased social deprivation and reduced life expectancy among Black people, Hispanic people, and people of another or undetermined race or ethnicity. In contrast, we found that gentrification was related to better or unchanged contextual determinants of health for Asian people and white people. In other words, gentrification is bad oftentimes for the health of black and brown people. The most significant adverse effects of gentrification were experienced by black and Hispanic people who were forced to move away because of gentrification which often resulted in them being more socially isolated and moving further away, for example, from things like public transportation or access to jobs. So this is not all that surprising. So again, when we strive for a more equitable newer, part of what we have to do is figure out how we make the tent bigger not saying it is a finite tent, and as people with more resources come in, people with less resources must be forced to ask. So if we're going to foster equitable growth in Newark, we have to strengthen the city's neighborhood. Every neighborhood in the city should have access to health care, convenient public transportation, libraries, grocery stores, well-maintained streets and sidewalks, and all city residents should have access the safe and well-maintained green spaces and parks where children can play and adults can exercise. You have no idea how many times I say to my patients, you got to get more exercise. And they're like, have you seen my neighborhood? You know, right? Right? We have to be able to reframe that. We must continue to work to improve air quality and remove other environmental toxins from our communities as well. Yes. We have made in Newark significant progress in a number of these areas, but more must be done. And the key in part to more being done is everybody in this room committing to do your part mm -hmm. in helping to ensure mm -hmm. that more gets done. Thank you. Well, when we talk about more getting done, uh, one of the biggest players that people usually talk about are developers. Um, we know that when it comes to homelessness, in order to solve that problem, it's like we need to have more housing. So I want to introduce a very interesting type of developer. Um, Vivian Cox Frazier is the president and CEO of the Urban League of Essex County. She's been in that position since 2004. She's transformed it. Traditionally, people think of the Urban League as a social services agency, but she has created it into a community development corporation launching initiatives like the Financial Opportunity Center and the Affordable Housing Project to promote economic empowerment. Her commitment um, stems from growing up in Washington, D.C., where she observes stark disparities in resource access and has integrated the importance of education to every aspect of the league's program. Please join me in welcoming Dr. <laughs> And uh, you're right, I've been at the Urban League 20 years. <laughs> and when I started, I was only going to be there for the summer. So that's another story for another day. But I like to say, God puts you where you're supposed to be. And uh, uh, I think that's true for me. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, the Urban League is traditionally known as a social service organization. And our agency here in, in Newark, we were founded by William Ashton, who was the first black social worker in New York. So for over 100 years, we really, my man, yeah, for almost 100 years, we were focused on social services. And uh, I tell everybody, I'm in social service all day. But social change, that takes resources, mm -hmm. right? And so really, I started thinking, you know, if, if my, and the Urbanist mission is to advance economic opportunity for African-American families and other disadvantaged communities. And we do that work through program services, bridge building, and advocacy. And we were doing that a long time. And uh, we were tutoring about 400 kids. And I tell this story often. Uh, we were tutoring about 400 kids. And uh, the young woman who was running our tutoring program 
She asked me to she grew up in Newark. She went to Sarah Lawrence. She came back. She was running our tutoring program. And she said, uh, I'm not gonna meet my numbers in terms of the number of kids. And I said, Well, why not? And she said, Well, uh, I don't have enough kids. And I said, Well, open the door and go get them. Right? So, <laughs> That's when we found out she was doing all her recruitment by mail. So then we figured out that uh, that's the problem. So, you know, we went out into the neighborhood with my team. And I used to, like, I'm just for the panel today, okay? But anyway, I used to tell my team, you have to wear a certain tie or early polo when you go out, you got to dress professionally. And I say, they left my office and they went maybe four blocks into our neighborhood and they encountered another young man in his urban attire. They had Timberlands and white swing shirts. He was on the corner and they started talking about the Urban League. They said, Urban He was like, Urban League, what's that? <laughs> so uh, then he said, yeah, we, have some we have a tutoring program. We're going to tutor these kids and uh, we need to recruit. And he said, okay, that woman over there, she got about five badass kids. She probably needs some tutoring. <laughs> so like they said, oh, thank you very much. But as they were leaving, he said, I can't believe somebody like you will come and talk to somebody like me. Mm -hmm. That was a war mm -hmm. I mean, I laid on myself. I cried. I was crying. I was crying. What am I going to do? Uh, but then I thought, okay, I'm going to do a strategic plan for this neighborhood, and we're going to figure out how to, you know, what they want, how to get it, everything like that. <laughs> and so, you know, this work, there's been a lot of aha moments if you think about building an equitable city uh, and how you do that in neighborhoods. So I go to the neighborhood meeting and I say, education, education, education. They said they abandoned property, the crime, the you know, the lack of housing. You know, they were talking about all these things. I said, so, wow. Well, I got to focus in on what they want and what they wanted to focus in on. And so I'll I'll say, you know, Davis sort of says, "Come to a community developer." I think that's me. But that's when I started learning about a little organizing too, because. When you start talking about who owns what, what gets to come into your community, you got to get ready to fight. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'm not looking for a fight, but we're not running for one either. So we had a little fight. <coughs> so my call could get me into it. <laughs> so sorry, you might remember that, but I'm saying, when you talk about resources and who gets them, that's when, you know, that's when you have conflict. Uh, and then, um, my father was from the south. He said, Daddy, can we help you? He said, See me to fight with big, you help the big. So I said, Okay. So we you know, always knew how to fight. And I grew up in an urban area, and how and I talk about DC. Like, I had to fight to get home every day. So I, I understood you know, how to fight. So, but what I'm interested in now is um, beyond the social services, and you mentioned the capitalist. You know, we're in a capitalist society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, like, Hey, we're worried about gentrification, and I told people, if you own it, they can't take it. <laughs> Say it again. If you own it, they can't take it. So I think one of the problems is, you know, who owns Newark? And that's one of uh, David's titles of his study that he did, like, who owns Newark? Right. And, and that's the work uh, the Urban League is really, you know, highly focused on now, which is how to get capital, Take it from the people that have it and get it to the poor people. Because if you want to eliminate the racial wealth gap, you have to move poor people. And that means they have to own. So that's the work uh, that we're doing now. And I would say in terms of uh, policy that came up, no, there is this event, systematic disadvantage and in inequity. Uh, that's built in. You can read Color of Law, any number of books. Uh, I mean, even my own family, my, my parents' mortgage had a had a clause in the mortgage, do not sell to you know Negroes. <laughs> you know, so it, it's it's built in, and once you realize that, you realize you can't fight the same way. Now maybe you can't use the master's tool to fight the master, you know things like that, but you can't use like social services alone. So I said urbanly, yes, we're the social safety net, but we also have to be the trampoline. And for a long time, our work was really focused. That trampoline was getting people better jobs. And we still do that. Uh, but as you mentioned, the Financial Opportunity Center is a partnership we have with LIS. Uh, we changed the Urban League's work so that um, the people that were coming in for home ownership were essentially different people than the people that were coming in for rental assistance. I thought we got to change that. So when you, have to come, when you come in, you have to talk about ownership. 
of your community, and that means civic participation and economic participation. So I would say there's there's no equitable development without equity. I'm going to say that again. The type of equity I'm talking about is capital and resources, right? So you can't bootstrap your way out of poverty. So I, I say, like, I'm guilty of my generation, which is, you know, we would just, like, work hard. Yes. You know, when I got bused to another school and I wasn't doing too well, even though I was a valedictorian in my elementary class, my father said, oh, you just need to work harder. Turn off that radio and work harder. <laughs> he didn't quite realize, like, maybe some tutoring and some supplemental resources might have helped me. Uh, but I'm saying, a lot of times, we have a perspective that there's something that people who are in poverty aren't working hard enough. They aren't doing enough things. Well, it recently came out, like how high North Carissa, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's not about working harder. It's about not having enough resources in your household. There's a lot of research around scarcity and what it does to people's thinking mm -hmm. and how it, make your how it affects your decision making. So I think in terms of an equitable city, there's no equity without equity. And so really, we spent a lot of resources around building affordable, uh, affordable rental housing. And I think that's important because you need affordable rentals in order to be able to own, yeah. right? So you don't have enough money to rent. How are you gonna have money to own? Yeah. And so I really uh, want to say that uh, the policy piece, we have to think about how to change it so that home ownership and business ownership and ownership in our community gets the resources it needs to get done. Mm -hmm. So I have done some, I'm a, we are doing a, a low income housing tax credit project. It's interesting when you see how certain formulas can be changed, mm -hmm. benefit certain things, a developer, you know, and then when you try to do home ownership, you don't get the same, the formula doesn't quite work that way. So uh, I think, you know, I'm really interested in, in, in policies that does, that will actually incentivize home ownership in urban communities. So there are programs with the USDA, for example, that will help you buy a home, a single family home in rural communities. Where does that exist in an urban environment? And even now we're, we're building houses and actually uh, Julio Colon and Natani Gilsmith from our team are in the audience. I just have to shout them out because when you start trying to manipulate capital, it takes a lot of brain capital too. Like, oh my God, not again, like some other way uh, to make it affordable. But we're building two family homes and uh, they're going to be completed soon. And the sales price is between 145000 to 190000 Wow. Two families. So that family will have ownership and they'll have a rental income. And in 20 years, they'll hold the whole thing and they can transfer wealth to their family. So. That everybody's got to do their part, and so I can't solve. We can't solve every problem there is, uh, but I am interested in solving the problem of ownership in Newark, and uh, that's the work that we do. So oh, thank you. I want to say, Vivian, I mean, I think that's incredible to hear about those prices of a two-family home in Newark. Yeah. I mean, I wish we could get some of those where I'm from. Um, so, actually, I realized I didn't introduce myself. I'll go very quickly before I introduce our next organizer, who, by the way, passed a very, very important bill that we modeled um, in Jersey City. So, my name is Musab. I'm from Jersey City. Um, a little bit of background. I actually went to school here at Rutgers Newark. So very familiar with the city. And I got to say, the most important thing of any city are the people in that city. Yeah. And if people are not engaged, if people are not involved, you're never actually going to make a difference in that community. And that's something that this school actually taught me when I went here. Um, inspired me to run for office in my hometown. I got elected on the school board. I was a school board president in Jersey City. Served there for a couple of years, went off to law school, graduated, and came back. And then uh, work with Professor Trout. We have a, uh, a paper coming out about gentrification talking about Newark, Jersey City, and Patterson. Mm -hmm. Plugging after the afternoon for those of you guys that are going to stay, you'll get some insight. But I go back to saying, you know, the most important thing for a lot of this is people power, right? It's the idea of people coming together. 
as we mentioned, you know, you have to have people who are all uh, working together doing their part. So our next speaker is Maria Lopez Nunez. Uh, she's the deputy director of the Ironbound Community Corporation. She's a prominent environmental justice organizer who advocates for policies addressing environmental injustice at local, regional, and national levels. She serves on the board of the Climate Justice Alliance and the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. She's played a key role in passing New Jersey's cumulative impact laws, the nation's strongest, and helped to establish Newark as the third city in the U.S. with the right to counsel. Yeah. Yeah. I like to say we're the third city in the but we're the first broke city. <laughs> <laughs> Before yeah. Newark, it was New York and San Francisco, so the city with surplus. And so obviously that's a much tougher case to make. <laughs> when you don't have a surplus, but you know that it matters, that folks have a right to counsel. Yeah. Um, that the right to counsel story actually started because some folks who undocumented came to our office. And it was during the previous administration. And so a lot of uh, social services were very nervous to take undocumented people for fear that their federal funding would be pulled. And so, you know, I, I'm sure most of you know the iron bomb is full of undocumented folks. You know, we estimate it might be 70 to 80 percent. So I've sat in many presentations where the data is not right. You know, I've sat with the Regional Planning uh, Association where they're showing us a map of all these folks are okay here. Um, and I was like, what do you mean? In, in the middle of all the <laughs> so the undocumented folks there. And they're like, well, we just don't have the data, so we assume the medium, right? And so there's a lot that goes wrong with that with data, <laughs> um, particularly in places where people are not going to enter the census. I don't think that's unique to undocumented people. It's pervasive through through Newark, because we've been told and we have reason to not trust our government, right? So we have a different case to make here in Newark. And I love what you said, it is about the people. I love my mayor, but I'm gonna give the credit about a lot of the legislation and work we've done to the amazing organizing history of Newark. Because if it's not, you know, you have to be part of our community uh, to get things done here. It's not even gonna have massive resistance. And we've seen that, you know, throughout our whole city with development. I've been so proud of the amount of fights that we've been able to have against developers who come to our city and think that because we're desperate, and I can acknowledge we are a little desperate sometimes, <laughs> That they can take advantage of us. And it's reflected in, you know, you know, I'll step back here. I grew up in Brooklyn, you know, before gentrification on a $450 three bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. So before gentrification, you know, <laughs> like, for, for me and my grandma getting held up at love point and putting bricks in my book bag just in case, you know. So I had a, an insurance to get home. But I can see how. You know, city change. The place I grew up in does not exist anymore. You know, Brooklyn became one of the most expensive places ever. Yeah. And that's how I ended up in Newark. But honestly, Newark felt just like home. <laughs> it felt, you know, just the folks <coughs> here and then the physical environment, right? I grew up thinking, you know, environmentalism and tree loving was just for white people because I grew up in a neighborhood that was all concrete and had very limited parts. I didn't really understand that that was something that we needed to deal with. You know, my young adulthood, I was mostly focused on racial justice. I thought that that's where the biggest stands could be made, especially against police brutality or maybe housing. I had experienced homelessness because of getting evicted from our home when the landlord died and the rent tripled overnight, right? So I come to this and, you know, I'm in Newark and I realized, huh, someone said it smells really bad. And they're like, let's call that in. I'm like, why? That's just what it is. It smells bad. Um, you know, I realized that it's something that's become normalized in us. The bad smell is supposed to be called in, and then it opened up this whole world of wow, our physical environment is actually treated by our race, the color of your skin, and where you come from. It dictates the type of quality air you have access to, you know, the amount of green space. I went to Drew University, and I remember taking the, the train from Newark, and as you leave Newark, you can see it get greener and greener and greener. Yeah. Yeah. And I started realizing the people also get wider and wider. <laughs> you know, like, that's, that's easy to see. What the hell? <laughs> but yeah, here I thought, you know, it was just like the police and homelessness, right? That were like the biggest threat of my life that I was running away from. 
but realizing that no, the air is trying to kill us, and all these things are like a foundation, right? Like the place that we grow up and, and what we have access to is foundational. It doesn't matter if we get the best education if our lungs were damaged um, from growing up in a city like Newark. So in Ironbound, we have three power plants. We're fighting a fourth power plant. Ironbound only four square miles. We have the largest garbage incinerator, the largest sewage waste treatment facility. PBSC, the State Valley Sewage Commission, they treat the, the human waste of 12 states. I need you to understand that this is beyond Newark. The garbage incinerator helps 30 municipalities and gets half of its trash from New York City. Um, you know, we have the largest port. That means that all of commerce, you know, we're talking about capitalism. We need products, goods, right, to come through that port and be sold to the rest of the area. Newark is not benefiting from that. You know, I, of course, I'm all for, let's talk about affordable housing and how we can get more ownership. But first, I want to get more ownership out of the businesses that have exploited us. You know, when I think about equity, I think about all the trillions of dollars that have been made on the backs of people that grew up in New York that are exposed to lead and, and have that, you know um, different learning outcomes because mm -hmm. of that. I think about the kids with asthma. Newark has one of the highest rates of asthma in the country, not just our state. It's one of our four kids. Mm -hmm. So when we're dealing with that, you know, as we just start thinking, you know, for me, almost everything else seems like it's on top as a foundation. The, the the physical location of New York has been exploited. We've been stolen from. Yeah. And people have made tons of money. And when we talk about community benefit agreements, all they offer us is workforce development. You know, I think we need to go beyond workforce development. I'm sorry, but you're running a business, you need workers. If you know, you're not doing me a favor. It's a mutually beneficial agreement. If you're also going to then dump on our city. You know, use our city's infrastructure. I think we need to pay up more. You know, so that's when I start thinking about equity, especially in this moment. We're about to transition the whole foundation of our economy from a fossil fuel based economy to probably a green one. I think their transition will happen no matter what. But are we going to, is it going to be a just transition? Are we going to be a part of it? Are we going to have ownership in the businesses of tomorrow? And then I think that that then translates to us having more ownership of the physical locations because yes i'm all for home ownership but i think about our neighborhoods and i see a lot of folks that don't have a job to keep up with the mortgage and i see projects that take a long time they're beautiful projects continue them we all have hope but in order to deal with the majority of our city you know we, we need to up the amount of income coming to our city but also we know that the housing market has been incredibly speculative you know, and that brings me to zoning and <laughs> not I mean, let's just not credit anybody. Zoning um, changes happen in the beginning, right? Because new workers demanded a real master plan. Right. And so I am proud of, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I'm, I'm just here kind of reaping the benefits, thank you all. <laughs> but, you know, the fact that the city was able to say, I want to, I want to stay in how our city looks is amazing. We actually beat back the sludge plan where they were going to burn human waste um, to make that like, cement out of it. That was all because of what was left 10 years for us in the zoning plan. And so it's important for our city as we try to take advantage of the money coming to downtown that we're keeping an eye on it, right? That it's not running away from us. So that's how I myself, you know, that is the thing. <laughs> um, I'll give myself eight minutes. Um, but yeah, we have to stay on top of these things. And I trust that the new workers, they're not going to stop looking. You know, I love how accountable this city holds its elected officials. It is not easy to be an elected official in the city of Newark. <laughs> there are folks that will show up to city council and will show where you live, will show where you're hanging out. Um, so I'm proud to have to be part of that legacy. And you know, when I think about why our city seems so good, it's because Folks who are affected by the issues, they're at the forefront. You know, we have not let outsiders in to tell us what to do and how to do it. And I don't think now is the moment to do so. We need to, you know, really buckle down and keep the investment with our, with the people who have suffered the most, right? I would think the most vulnerable should be the way, and Newark has really provided that example and let us do that. So let's continue letting those most affected be the loudest voices. And all of us, that have the privilege of doing this work, we have to stand behind folks 
and keep pushing those voices forward. So thank you. As she mentioned, uh, you know, we've, we've actually run a little bit behind on time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask them two questions. You guys are each going to have about a minute to respond. <laughs> and then I'm going to leave it open for at least one audience question. So there has to be at least one person here who's really thinking of a good question. Don't give me one of those questions where you give the 10 minute introduction and then the question. Let's just go with the question which you guys have ready. Okay. So the first question for you guys is what indications of an equitable city do you see in Newark? What are the indications that you see that's an equitable city? It's articulated. I mean, that, that, that's, and it's forefront. Um, we're looking at it from all sorts of different angles, but I, I think we have a pretty good idea that equity means more than just capital, it means sharing that capital and, and, and make sure that uh, it's, it's uh, lifting all boats. So I think that's what I see from the outside. It's articulated terrifically well. How well will it be executed? I don't think we're an equitable city yet. Let's not get out of it. So, <laughs> I think we're headed there. And as long as, you know, Newark does to get to equity or even, even notions of equality, right? Like, I don't, um, I know that there are a lot of great forces against that. And so Newark has to stick together. And I do see signs of Newark sticking together. I see the CDCs working together. The, uh, the city's administration is incredible about supporting community organizing and listening to community organizing when it's necessary, you know? So that's the sign to see of us going in the right direction. I would say also in terms of, uh, you know, how the city deploys its resources, you can see that they're deploying resources in a specific way. So I'd say like, if you look at any entity's budget or the resources they have, how they deploy it, whether it's at the state, the county, the city, you can see sort of what those priorities are. So I would say in terms of the flexible resources the city has, uh, you can look at the budget and see, you know, in the sense that even when the, the APRA money came down from COVID and everything, how were those resources deployed? Yeah, you know, there were resources that were deployed in neighborhood projects uh, to neighborhood entities around gardens, healthy food, things like that that benefited people. So I would say, I see that as a positive sign. Certainly, you know, you have to think about, uh, you know, a new governor coming in and different things. You know, how are all those uh, decisions going to continue to be impacting uh, the city and the residents? So I'm the family doctor up here. And we can't think about equity in Newark if we also don't think about health equity. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of work to do there. And we started by acknowledging a black man who died too young, too soon. Yes. And that's Congressman Payne. Mm -hmm. And his death is replicated over and over and over again in this city. And so in addition to the incredibly important economic gains that we have to make, we also have to make gains in our health outcomes if we are truly going to do that. All right, I'm going to ask another question. As you guys think about that and grapple with this concept of equity within the city of New York, and I want you to simply name these forces as you perceive them, who do you see as the allies pushing towards equity, and who do you see as the enemies? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I'll say capitalism doesn't need any help. It's gonna find its way. So what's going on is when you when people when we sold our when we sold the, the first phase of these houses that we did, we found people coming in from Brooklyn because they thought it was such a bargain, right? Yeah. Whereas we were having trouble getting the residents that live in the neighborhood to, to buy right? to believe like no, you should invest where you live. So I would say capitalism doesn't need any help. It's going to take care of itself. So, you know, that's what I would say. The enemy of the people <laughs> is capitalism, but you've got to, you know, figure out how to work around that. And also the communities around, uh, like I said, they'll see Newark as a bargain. And that, that, that's, that's the force. Uh, 
I, we, we can't get in front of it because it's already here. Yeah. But I, I would say that, that that's not an outlaw. So I'm going to be hopefully not too controversial, but a major enemy of equity in New York is people who don't vote. School board, city council, state level, people got to vote because you know what? The crazy is going on in this country right now. It's called a whole bunch of us did not me. I'm not in that. I vote. A whole bunch of y'all didn't vote. I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, I speculative development, which is that you're so far again, and people are looking to take advantage of the city and, you know, just gamble on them. They can hold property. They're yeah. very horrifying. Yeah. And they run the market up. But it does become inaccessible. Um, and obviously, I think dirty industry. Newark is trying to clean up its act. I think the whole country is. But places like Newark are incredibly vulnerable. You know, the fact that we are fighting for power plant, mm -hmm. just the fact that sludge plant. Those shouldn't be the types of businesses that we're attracting. Exactly. They only have employees, and all they do is be a sipper. I would second the voting issue. It's true across the board in cities across the country. Yeah. Candidates vote uh, is about 20%. It's pathetic. Uh, the bosses rule in that situation. The money comes top down. Uh, beneficiaries are the bosses uh, and not the people. Uh, but I would say one last thing, and let's not forget the region. Regions have squeezed uh, the cities for a long period of time. They've, they've drawn resources out. They've avoided <laughs> the, the, the plants that are polluting the air and, and providing all the nuisances. We, we, we talk a lot about regional equity, but it, we really have a hard time grasping it, making it work, and even talking about it. So uh, I hope that might be part of our conversation today. <laughs> All right, we're going to turn it over to the audience. Uh, so I see a question in the back. Good morning. My name is Dr. Kyle Young Shippers. I am the chief editor of Bark Republic, but also my professor. My question is directly uh, to the individuals who talked about the ownership. Uh, at Bark Republic, we've been tracking a correlation that has been happening. The correlation is uh, unaffordable housing and inequitability in housing is correlated to the low votership. So it, in my opinion, as, as living 12 years in Newark and actually doing my research for my uh, dissertation in Newark, it is kind of unfair, not kind of, it is very unfair to hold people responsible to vote when they don't even have a reliable place to live. And so that instability creates this issue of ownership. I would like to know what your response uh, is uh, with, with that. Yeah. Okay. So, so you were the one. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a lot of interesting data about populations that don't vote and the reasons why. What I would argue is that it's only by voting that some of these situations will change. That's right. That's if right. we underestimate the power of politics in this country, now don't get me wrong, a lot of politics is driven by capitalism. Maybe I'm with you. <laughs> On the other hand, I'm totally gonna blame people who don't vote. Yes. My my ancestors died for the right to vote. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there, there has been for decades this idea of uh, voting puts people in place and puts policies in place in order to move the ball forward. In Newark specifically, we have not seen that. Actually, people have been in place and they have only moved the ball forward for a few, a select few. So how do we address, and this is not just Newark, this is not just a Newark issue, this is going on in um, cities across the country. And the reason why I'm asking that this is that we often task the younger folks about voting, but we as the older, I can say that now, as the older folk, right, have not really done our due diligence and really kind of breaking down what civic engagement is. Once you get the person in office, 
how do you hold them accountable? Right, you know, things right. like that. So I, I just want to say I'm with you. I'm, I'm there with you. But I'm going to tell you. People got to vote. Everybody. Every people got to vote. Look at what's going on in this country right now. Who's voting and who's not voting and the mess we're in. That's all I'm going to say. No, I actually. So, you know, I'll be controversial. Right on. I do agree that people have to vote, but I also agree with the commenter. There's a lot. I think it's dynamic. And I do think, again, I'm thinking like an organizer, if I want people to vote, then it's my job to be people. You know, like, it's, I can't just yell at them to vote. I have to have a compelling story and not ignore that they don't trust the government. And there are valid reasons for that. And how are we winning? Because if we keep picking fights, well, we keep losing. Yeah. I, I'm going to just say, you know, I say, hang out with losers, right? And so <laughs> we do need to pick winning fights, compelling fights, and have like good arguments for why people should come out and support us. You know, so let's not let's not do our homework. Let's not be lazy. We got a lot of work to do, and times are only getting tougher. And that sentiment is growing, and I don't think we can afford to ignore it. And I just want to say, I mean, I want to give a big shout out to Newark. So the other work I do is organizing with the Vote 16 Coalition. Uh, so Newark is now the largest city that's actually allowed 16-year-olds to vote in local school. Board. Sorry, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, they didn't get to vote in the election. This happened, and the turnout in that election was 2%. 2.7. 2.7. I'll call it 2%, just for the drama. 7% percent people in Newark voted in that school board election. Mm -hmm. The data shows actually when you allow 16 year olds to vote, they vote at 40%. Mm -hmm. So we are transforming civic culture by starting at a younger age and getting younger people more involved. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna leave it for one more question. Last question. Yes. Uh, regarding the homeless situation in the city, uh, if you look back at the homeless population decade by decade, it is trend is transformed. I don't remember the homeless population being what it was and being to the extent that it was, say, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, we've spoken with some folks, and really the question is, is, there's been an influx of homeless people into the city, almost an importation of homeless people in the city. How can we address that? Because there are municipalities around us that are not only dumping other things into the city, but they're dumping their homeless population into the city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we hold them accountable? So, uh, Louis Hilario spends a lot of time thinking about this, by the way. He's the director of homelessness services here. And, and one of the things we ought to start doing is to, uh, more of the model that they have in Bergen County, um, where they really do sort of look at uh, where people are from. So that, you know, when New York puts people on the PATH train or when the suburban communities give people that bus ticket and say go to Newark, um, that we then have a greater ability to say, no, not, not here. Right. Yeah, right. Now, mm -hmm. I am ambivalent about that. Let me be really clear. Because in many instances, at least we have some services for folks. And a lot of those suburban communities that put people on a bus and send them to Newark, they know. And so the, 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 the challenge that you are confronting us with is the practicality and the finances of homelessness juxtaposed to the humanity of the people we're talking about. Are we any better when we put people on the path train and say, you got to go back to New York? Are we any better? What, what we ought to do is find a way to get resources for then providing services to folks. Because if we just get in that game as well, again, we're just using human beings as pawns. And so I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what you said. And certainly when I was on the Homelessness Commission, we we grappled with this issue a lot. But let's just not make it a simplistic answer that's all about, you know, shipping off people. Mm -hmm. But I would also say it's, it's both and. Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, how did all these suburban towns 
you know, succeed from Newark in the beginning. Oh, yeah. And why did they do that, right? Oh, yeah. The same thing, you can't have exclusive enclaves surrounding an urban core like this. We, we, we have to do something about uh, the broader region and every community and you don't want to say take their share sort of like, uh, oh, when well, you're like dishing people up there. No, but you can't, uh, the way taxes are done in, in the state and real estate taxes, so many things, whether it's <laughs> in the schools or uh, just housing, uh, how, how long did these suburban communities avoid providing their fair share of affordable housing? So they don't, they don't take their share of, the, it's sort of like, um, I don't know, they just don't take their share of uh, the issues that are underfunded. You know, they don't want to take any underfunded things. They just want to fund what they want to fund, right? So I remember I grew up at a time when they had anti-poverty programs that, you know, we had a lot of programs to go. My parents were working, they said, go to a program, go to a program, go to the pool. Well, when you're in an exclusive community, you don't need a public pool because you have a pool in your backyard or a pool in your community. So I don't want to fund those things that we don't use. It's sort of a libertarian view of things. I don't use it. I don't need to pay for it. But you do benefit from it. You know, so I do think we need to talk about, you know, sharing the needs to create a more inclusive state, right? So that the diversity of our state is reflected in the diversity in our communities. And therefore, guess what? Nobody's hearing more of the more of the unfunded issues than anybody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. One last question for me as well, because I know we're running out of time. I apologize. But Matthew Desmond has written this book called Poverty by America. Everyone needs to read that book. And the reason you need to read that book is Matthew Desmond makes a very compelling case that we can eliminate poverty in this country. And we don't talk about eliminating poverty in this country. A lot of the problems that we're talking about on this panel relate to poverty. We are the richest country still on the face of this planet. We can eliminate poverty. All of us also need to become voices in public settings saying, oh yeah, and by the way, let's eliminate poverty and then try to work to make it happen. Because that's to your point, Vivian, about who's in and who's out and who pays for what. All right, guys, can you give me five minutes? Uh, <laughs>